Our fascination with Mars isn't new. The ancient Egyptians knew of its reddish color. The Romans gave it the name we use today after their god of war. But it wasn't until the beginning of the 17th century that the astronomer Johann Kepler turned his eyes toward the red planet and changed the world forever with his discoveries. Kepler was troubled by the fact that the church-enforced model of an Earth-centered universe didn't explain the strange motion of Mars he saw in the night sky. Instead of following a straight path in the sky, Kepler observed a retrograde or backwards looping motion of Mars every two years. What he saw was indicative of a solar system that revolved around the Sun, not the Earth. And in determining this, he discovered the first laws of planetary motion. His laws led to our understanding of the orbital mechanics that have allowed spacecraft to fly around and explore our solar system. Those very spacecraft are controlled here at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. JPL manages the day-to-day -day operations of the robotic exploration of our solar system. From this 177-acre campus just northeast of Los Angeles, deep space explorers keep track of the fleet of spacecraft currently probing the depths of our own star system. Dr. Dan McLeese is the chief scientist for NASA's Mars Exploration Program. The exploration of Mars began uh, in the early 60s with missions that flew by the planet and attempted to get a basic sense of the way that Mars expresses itself. We'd seen it in Earth-based telescopes for over a hundred years and it seemed to be a dynamic planet. It seemed to be a planet where in fact life might be present on the surface. There was a lot of speculation at the turn of the century, about 1900, 1910, about canals on Mars, possibly an advanced civilization dealing with difficulties of a global climate change. In fact, one of the most prominent astronomers of the time, Percival Lowell. Percival popularized the idea of canals, and he thought that the civilization on Mars was in fact dealing with climate change by bringing water from the polar regions to the equator where they lived. The recent buzz of water on Mars would not have been news to Lowell. His passionate belief in a dying, water-starved civilization on Mars has helped shape popular culture's view of extraterrestrial and alien life ever since. Even today, there is wild speculation by some that pyramids and a haunting humanoid face on the surface of Mars are signs of a past advanced civilization. The region known as Cydonia has captured the imagination of many. Some are convinced that this photographic evidence proves the past existence of advanced civilizations. But recent high-resolution photographs have revealed that they are nothing more than a trick of light and shadow. Still, there are those who believe. By the mid-70s, we had flown the Viking missions. I remember when I was, oh, 12, I guess, and Viking landed. And I remember getting that analog magazine, and the cover was a photo of the Viking image of the surface, and just going, wow, I want to be there. Viking landed two missions on the surface of the planet. It searched for life. It actually conducted biological experiments, studies of chemistry, looking for biological signatures. And it found none. It seems that the surface of Mars is entirely sterile. And this was a disappointment to many scientists. We were pretty discouraged after the Viking spacecraft because life didn't fit our template of where it should be and what it should be. And yet we've seen since that time, even by our exploration of Earth and the robustness of life, its ability to populate these very hostile environments, that Mars is not that harsh compared to some of these terrestrial environments where life has indeed flourished. The planet had clearly been rich with water early in its history, and what remains is an arid, dry planet where no life could live exposed on the surface. What happened became the question. So we did a series of missions to the planet trying to investigate this basic question of what happened to the planet, what kinds of changes in its climate might have produced this dry, arid world. 
And if there was life, what happened to it? Today, we're flying missions to the surface and into orbit in an attempt to search for that water. We're looking for the water because it is water with organic molecules and a source of energy like the sun that might have made life prosper on Mars. Those successful missions started out with two remarkable missions, a robotic lander called Mars Pathfinder and an eye in the sky called Mars Global Surveyor. Launched back to back, these missions arrived nine months later, signaling our return to the Red Planet. In 1997, amidst tremendous public support, Pathfinder's picture-perfect landing marked the beginning of a new era in space exploration, NASA's cheaper, better, and faster program. In response to increasing cost-cutting pressures, the Space Administration developed smaller missions that could be fast-tracked to their objectives. Pathfinder was a product of this new philosophy, with a budget of less than some of today's blockbuster movies. This is compared to the billion-dollar-plus budget of the Viking program in the 1970s. Matt Gollumbeck was the project scientist for Pathfinder. I think the most amazing part is that Pathfinder was, was really an entry, descent, and landing demonstration. It was all about proving that you could land for this impossibly little amount of money and, and do it robustly. It had been 21 years since the last landing of a probe on the Martian surface. This created a challenge for engineers who were using new and yet unproven techniques to get sensitive equipment across interplanetary space and onto the surface of Mars. Pathfinder proved many new technologies, including airbag landings, solar cell power technology, and visual guidance systems for the robotic rover. Pathfinder didn't just prove new technology. It embarked on a longer than planned mission of science gathering that far exceeded the expectations of the project members. The information that it gathered was not only scientifically relevant, it directly answered important questions that had been raised about the planet. Part of it had to do with the ability of the rover to go out and look at things up close. One question that did get answered concerned evidence of flowing water on the surface at the site. We saw some rocks at the Pathfinder site that, that could be interpreted as conglomerates. These are rocks that are sedimentary rocks that form when liquid water rolls across the surface and forms roundish pebbles and cobbles and then carries those pebbles and cobbles and forms them into a sand and clay matrix into a rock. And if that is in fact a conglomerate, and that's an interpretation we don't know for sure, that says right there that liquid water was active at the surface. We saw evidence at the landing site that had been formed by this catastrophic flood, no question, large volumes of water involved in that. And we saw sand dunes at the site, which is a particular size of grain that's about a millimeter in size that hops along the surface. It gets saltated, as it's called, in the, in the wind stream. And it hops and it collects in these dune patterns. Water is involved in the production of those grains of sand on Earth. Scientists suggest that the Pathfinder evidence shows that there was a warmer past in Mars history. Shortly after Pathfinder completed its highly publicized and successful mission, another probe arrived at the Red Planet, but with less fanfare. Although Mars Global Surveyor didn't immediately get the public attention that Pathfinder did, it has gathered more data about the planet than all missions before it combined. We believed prior to our last mission, the one that was launched in 1996 called the Mars Global Surveyor, that we had a pretty good model in our minds for what Mars is like. However, when that mission arrived, we learned that we really know very little about the history of Mars, and in fact, even the modern Mars is a mystery to us. MGS has already made discoveries that scientists and researchers were totally unprepared for. It was Mars Global Surveyor that photographed the latest evidence of recent water activity on the Martian surface. As it continues to reveal more of the planet's mysterious details, planetary researchers are forced to ask deeper questions about the evolution of a nearby planet that may have harbored life. 
there is a growing sentiment that sending robots is not enough and that human explorers should prepare to explore Mars. The last time humans explored another world, it was not a planet, it was the moon.